the best way to measure your actual ketones? Is it blood, breath? What's good question? Yeah, uh, best versus also most like like easy for people as well. I mean, they're both kind of important. Again, but. like people don't like this, but it depends. So that's my answer to a lot of things. So it's context dependent. The the clinicians that are managing epilepsy patients say that urine is great, and they're not going to change from urine, and they're doing because they don't want to prick the the kid's finger too, right? So I did blood. I like using the glucose ketone index. Uh, the what keto, is that? Uh, it's your glucose over ketones in millimolar concentration. So if you're fasting, it takes me about 72 days, uh, 72 hours <laughs> to get. Although the guy fasted for 360 or 80 days, uh, I, fasting for 72 hours gets my glucose ketone index to one, where my glucose comes down to about three millimolar and my ketones come up to three millimolar. So that would be a glucose ketone index of one. And it's my belief, although I haven't measured LC3 and other components of the autophagosome, it's my belief that uh, achieving and sustaining a glucose ketone index of one for 24 hours will induce and perhaps maximize autophagy. No doubt that you can get more benefits five, seven days, but then at five days and seven days, I see a suppression in testosterone and other things I don't like. So uh, for me, three days is like the sweet spot. I can achieve a glucose ketone index of one, and then my breath acetone is off the charts. And I think breath acetone is probably your best ketone to measure if you want to lose fat. So all the carbons of the acetone you're blowing off essentially are from fat. So when you look at the device and it's reading like 40, it's like, ooh, you're just like basically exhaling fat carbons So from that. So I think uh, it's breath acetone is great because with beta hydroxybutyrate, I could be at two or three millimolar and just walk around the house or do some activity and then I'm back down to like below one. That's because your body's using the beta hydroxybutyrate as fuel and if you have a calorie deficit, you have high tissue uptake of beta hydroxybutyrate, right? Whereas my breath acetone seems to be more stable and a be- better correlate of fat oxidation. So, uh, and it's also easier. So if you're blowing into a breath acetone meter five times a day, that's a lot of money in strips and a lot of poking your finger. So I use the Readout Health Biosense device. And I don't know, I've blowed into mine like a thousand times and that would be cost prohibitive from a ketone monitoring perspective and a lot of finger pricks associated with that. And it has a pretty cool app and also a fasting sort of meter in with it. I think they collaborate with zero fasting. So I think there's some collaboration there, but it can show you if you're doing a fasting and and using that. Although it's more of a clinical device, but it's now it's broken into more mainstream. So it's an FDA approved class one or whatever physical uh, uh, device, medical device for measuring ketones. And I became interested in acetone because it correlates with uh, seizure control. So acetone does. So I, I recommend it to uh, parents who have kids that are managing and they don't want their fingers pricked and the, the, the urine ketone strips are not very accurate. So to answer your question, uh, I think both uh, blood ketone measurements, if if you're just starting the ketogenic diet, it may be good to just use urine to say, yes, you're in ketosis, you're not. It's like semi-quantitative and then spend the money to get a ketone meter, like the Keto Mojo device is probably one of the best. And then a breath acetone meter is good for people who are doing fasting and for people that are really interested in like weight loss. What about using blood glucose levels like as a proxy? Like is there... That's like super interesting. Yeah, we had an NIH workshop sort of on this and I brought this up as a continuous ketone uh, monitoring or continuous glucose monitoring system. And now you have the ketone monitoring system with Abbott has Lingo device now, which does like glucose, ketones, lactate, and also alcohol. But a CGM device is like the ultimate device to look at dietary adherence to a ketogenic diet because it should be the trace should be completely flat. And if there's big excursions, then that person's not on a ketogenic diet. I guess if they're under stress or they're exercising really hard, you might get a blip. But generally speaking, like a CGM trace is a very, very good way to tell if someone is is adhering to a ketogenic diet. 
So these things should be used. I think, generally speaking, the community also feels that this needs to be used, but it's an off-label use. Is the there time. like a level that's like a range, or does it vary? Like, would you, if you were to give an estimate, guesstimate of what the blood glucose level, like to to like for a ketogenic diet, for yeah, yeah, to say like I'm probably in ketosis because my blood yep. glucose levels are X. Yeah, uh, well, I could show you on my my. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what was very interesting when I woke up this morning, I spiked forty milligrams per deciliter. I've never seen that before like ever. And uh, so my CGM trace typically looks like, oh, probably now it's going to be, maybe I'm excited and maybe it's all over the place, but uh, it's going to look like, so I didn't, what I, I set it to, I added like an extra 30 so it wouldn't go off negative during everything. But right now, if you subtract 30 from that number, that's that's what your CGM trace should look like mm -hmm. on a ketogenic diet, and, and you've wearing you've worn a CGM yeah, I need before. To get so <laughs> I'm seventy four, yeah. So, but when I woke up this morning, it's not. I had a big. I, I only had maybe like four and a half hours sleep or something. Like, so it could be that. It could be the different time zone. Or something oh yeah, like totally. That. That's it. That's yeah, it. I mean, yeah, when yeah. I that was the first thing I learned from my CGM was because yeah. I started wearing it when my son was like four or five months old. Mm -hmm. So I was I was really like, I was waking up multiple times to breastfeed and oh, you know, yeah, I mean, so my sleep was huge insanely disrupted yeah. and yep. um, fragmented. And my blood glucose was just out. It was just going out of control. Mm -hmm. And it was always on the nights when I was like, like waking up multiple times and not getting enough sleep. And, mm -hmm. and that was like one of the biggest things I learned from my CGM that was surprising to me. Where were your highs? Like how high were your highs? So mine spiked to almost like 130 or 140. And that's unheard of. Like I've never seen that. But that just could be due to the time change and getting about half of the normal sleep that I get. I can't I mean, I feel recall. fine now. But okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's been too but many years. It was but just they highly were, it variable. Was, yeah. It was, yeah, it was something like that. It was above 120. Uh -huh. You know, like yeah. where it was like, this is postprandial level. Like, you know, yeah. like this is this yeah. is pretty like, you know, intense, yeah. you know, like yeah. a robust effect. Um, high intensity training. I was doing a lot of um, spin class and stuff, like uh -huh. hour long, like yeah. pretty intense spin. That was really, that would help. Like, so if I do the spin and then have the disruption that night after the spin, uh -huh. it was way better. Like my uh -huh. glucose was way better. So like the exercise totally helped negate some of the mm -hmm. glucose dysregulation that I was having. Or mm -hmm. I don't know what exactly was happening, but yeah. my, insulin, my glucose spiking so high. So, um, yeah. So that was a, also a learning. This, I learned so much from the from the CGM, and yeah. I I haven't worn it for a couple of months because I have to re. Yeah. I, I think I'm going to do levels because my prescriptions like expired. levels is and great. Now I'm, yeah, now I'm like okay. I think I'm going to move move to levels. Um, so I did. I'm not going to mention the other, but I did a couple different companies, and I just wore it. But levels, well, they're in beta now. But the 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 difference about levels is that it's kind of coaching you and you also have the option to, I mean, you could just push and get to a nutritionist. So I guess that's good for people, maybe not like us, but but for the average everybody. But it has so many features built in. Uh, where I exercise, it'll say, you know, what did you do here? We saw that you exercised. So it, be, it learns my body, even if I have a cup of coffee in the morning, it learns my sort of uh, dawn effect. And I just take a picture of my food, it event marks it, and then it sends me an email the next day of the picture of my food, uh, my average glucose effect, my metabolic score, and things like that. So it's so easy. Otherwise, I mean, you could just buy a CGM, I guess if you had someone prescribe it to you and just look at the CGM trace and then make your own inference. But I kind of like having, as long as I engage with the app and I take a picture of my food and everything, I get the email the next day and that tells me what happened to my glycemic oh, response cool. the whole day. And it also gives me a weekly thing. So all I have to do is just engage with the app once a day, and it sends me like a daily report and also a weekly report where I could see like every day. Uh, and there's so many features. I don't even use like 90% of the features, but I use like 10% of the features, and it's very useful to me. Um, and I think, so we're doing a clinical trial right now with CGM. and. People have app fatigue. Not everybody wants to be on an app all day, but you can engage with it as much as you want, or just you know engage with it. Two or three minutes per day is enough to really be getting a lot of insight into your own metabolism. So. I, I found just even just wearing the CGM, 
without even having to do all the app stuff, yeah. really helped me figure out what foods yeah. that I should be eating and portion sizes and all that stuff because it was like, What you know, were your biggest surprises? Um, the spinach, the cooked spinach was yeah, the one because yeah, 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 I was yeah. like, oh, the all well, the sugar and it was a low glycemic, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but what you said makes a lot of sense. I think that was that was a big surprise. And then um, another really big surprise was like a lot of these like cauliflower rice. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like I was traveling in part on part of this. You know, where I was on the ketogenic diet, and so I would like order food that was like this is keto and you get something yeah. in the store and this is keto and I'm like this is not keto at all I'm like it's yeah, yeah. it's like spiking me so high yeah. and then you like track down the ingredients and it's like sugar and I'm like really you're calling yeah. this keto but you actually have added sugar in it yep. um, other surprises where I was taking some like collagen gummy chewables that didn't have any sugar allegedly yeah and my blood glucose just went through the roof and I'm like, what's in this? This yep. something same I mean, thing. I tried some kind of sugar free gummy, it shot me off the chart. Yeah. So, and so, all the bars that I get sent. So yeah, anything ninety percent of the yeah. <laughs> the only bar that's has completely ketogenic is uh, keto brick. So it's like the brick is ninety grams of fat. Like and I think twenty, like maybe thirty grams of protein and like hardly any carbohydrates, and it's a thousand calorie brick, and that's like truly the only ketogenic, you know, bar. There's a bunch keto of bars brick. out there, keto brick.